Teresa Sigalito Holima, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you, John. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to have this conversation. Um, we've been preparing for this for a while now and, you know, just busy schedules and trying to make sure that we're, we're fitting this in uh, at a time that, you know, will work for everybody. Um, you have such an accomplished background and I'm thrilled to have a conversation around the topic of your book, which I'll introduce in just a moment. But today we're gonna to be focusing the, our conversation on creating successful virtual teams across cultures. And as we get started, I just want to share Teresa's bio with everybody. Teresa Sigalito Holima is a cultural consultant, team coach, and an expert on leading virtually. Recently, she has added author to her description as she has written the book, Virtual Teams Across Cultures, Create Successful Teams Around the World. She has traveled the globe working with clients and now works with them virtually. Her work includes leadership development programs, team development programs, and interactive workshops. Currently, Teresa is managing director of Interact Global, where she works with a network of professionals to support leaders and teams to navigate global working. What a great background. And again, an incredibly timely um, topic and focus of the work that you're doing and how it connects with this, this particular time and place that we're in amidst the pandemic and trying to figure out how to do all of this stuff in an increasingly globalized, interconnected world, utilizing technologies to work in virtual teams. Um, so I'm super excited to have a, the, the conversation with you. Before we launch into that conversation, anything else that you would like to share by way of background or personal um, context? For the listeners. No, I think you did a ni very nice summary, so thank you for that. Uh, just for location, I'm an American citizen, but I've been in Europe almost uh, 25 years. So came over on a European project and ended up marrying our consultant. So I'm living just about an hour east of Amsterdam for those who, uh, who oh, are interested. Oh, beautiful Amsterdam. I love yeah, Amsterdam. It's, it's <laughs> nice. Well, that's great. I'm jealous because I love, I love Europe. I love traveling. Um, and, and so does my wife. So whenever we get the chance, uh, we, we love to go back and, and visit the sites and, uh, it's just amazing. So Amsterdam is, is a place I've been four or five times. My wife has never been. And so that's like on her, on her list of, you know, places she wants to go. Absolutely. Well, you're welcome. We're waiting for her. And uh, obviously, if you've been here a couple of times during the year, then you know the spring is the best time to come. Hop on some bikes and, and explore. It's a great place to be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Teresa. And, and it's always wonderful to have an international flavor to the podcast. So I appreciate you joining me. Uh, it's probably what? Uh, early evening there right now. Is that right? It's early evening. We are dark. So uh, <laughs> it gets dark here very early. But, uh, but that's okay. We have lights and candles and it's always nice to speak to everybody. And it's your morning. So it's this, this is, we're doing virtually and that's the beauty of- That's right. You know, we're doing it virtually. It works. And, yeah. and you know what? It's, it's, that's a good segue into um, our discussion. And I, I know that's what your book is all about. So we'll get into that in just a moment. But again, kind of laying out the context for this, it's amazing to me, you know, as, as a consultant and I do a lot of work internationally, um, both on the on the practitioner professional side, but also on the academic side. I'm also a professor. Um, and so I, I've been working in collaborative teams internationally for years and years. And I've done some of that virtually, uh, but also traveled to have those interactions. And it took the pandemic for me to like kind of open the lens of my mind towards like what these collaborations can actually look like now that everyone's just getting used to doing everything virtually all the time. Before, you know, we always tried to make sure that we had at least, you know, you know, some face-to-face -face interactions and travel involved. And now I, I'm actually collaborating way more internationally than I did before, just because everyone is so willing to just hop on a call and all of a sudden, boom, you're, you're, you're making progress on a project or whatever. It's a whole new world. I love what you just said. So prior to COVID, 
uh, we were working virtually and we were working across cultures for sure. We've been doing this for years and the technology has allowed more and more people to do it. So my book, I was already working on my book before COVID, way before COVID, by the way. And we have research on it and, and people like yourself were doing it. So, but now it's exploded. And I think also what's happening is that people are, rec it's more the work from home that has changed. So we've been working, uh, sitting in the Netherlands, working with China, working with the US, and we've been going to the office. But now we're working with China and the US and we're working from our own homes. And that gives a whole different flavor for so many reasons, which we can get into. But I think what's also interesting then is not just what's happened in the past and what's happening now, but what's going to happen in the future. Because this ability to be productive, to build trust, to lead, to get things done, to care for each other from a distance is going to stay with us. Nobody in my field of exploring what it means to work virtually would ever recommend this situation. Never. Because we do need the human contact. We do need to see each other. There is value in that. So being 100% without uh, seeing each other is not, is not a solution. But neither is going 100% back to the office. So there's something, I think it's an interesting conversation to see what does it mean for us as we go, go forward and, uh, and explore this together. Yeah, absolutely. And I completely agree with you. I think we'll end up having some sort of a hybrid, blended approach uh, moving forward once, once things you know, with the pandemic kind of get more under control and, and lockdowns are lifted and, and people are traveling again, or at least have the opportunity to travel again. Uh, and I have this conversation with my colleagues all the time too, especially in the university space. You know, that's one of the highlights for a lot of professors is like you get to travel and go places for conferences and, and yes, such, of course. and the university yeah. pays for it, right? And so that's like one of those kind of little perks of, of being in academia and nobody's as thrilled about doing virtual conferences right now. You know, it just doesn't have the same, <laughs> the same feel to it at all, so. People okay, are excited but, to get back to it. Yeah, okay, but there's something in between. I mean, there's something, it's a, now we can start thinking of different options. And, exactly. and let's face it, this also has an impact when everyone's flying on, the, on uh, the climate. So there's a lot more, we have a lot more options and we can use better decision criteria for when we decide to meet and when we choose to do, excuse me, to do things virtually. Yeah, absolutely. So, so tell us a little bit about why you decided to even write the book. Like, mm. As you mentioned, you've been working on it for a long time, uh, pre-COVID. It just happened yes. like it, 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 it lined up perfectly, right? <laughs> With this, this, <laughs> this uh, time, uh, you know, it's so relevant. But when did you get started? Why did you get started? Why did you see it as important and necessary uh, for people to better understand how to leverage virtual work, virtual teams, and doing it in a cross-cultural environment? Sure. So just to go back to my background for a moment. So I have a business background and I came to Europe and I started working on European projects, uh, acquisitions in Central and Eastern Europe. So, and I, what I found so interesting was the cultural element that sometimes it could be a source of frustration, right? Miscommunication, uh, everybody blaming each other, but sometimes it was also a source of innovation and actually fun uh, and, and, you know, creativity and enjoyment. And so 15 years ago, I became a cultural consultant. But then I realized when you're working with a team, you can only go so deep when you're talking about culture. So about 10 years ago, I studied to be a team coach. Then about seven years ago, my clients were coming to me saying, we're working across cultures, we're working in teams, but we're also working virtually. Can you help us understand that? And so I brought those three together and that was the work that I've been doing for quite a few years and also what it means for leadership and organizations when we work globally and virtually. What I realized when I looked at the book market was that there were many books on working across cultures and many books on working remotely, but nothing or very few that brought them together. And since that's my sweet spot, I decided to write a book because I wanted to contribute to the conversation. Now, since you're coming from university, I, uh, I also am very interested in that because the way I decided to approach the book was I have three sources. The first one was my experience with my clients, but the second one was academia because I think academia has so many rich and robust research and models and ideas and theories that we have, can learn, but that aren't really brought to the business community enough. And so, and I love that. 
science practice link. So I uh, read papers on organizational development, technology, leadership, I mean, the whole thing. And I, and I get, I really enjoy that. And I translated it into biz, uh, practical solutions in my book. And then the third source were interviews with leaders and teams who work virtually and who do it well. So bringing those three things together is the content of my book. Well, that's, that's excellent. And it's always, I mean, both from a, a practical side of just like you found the niche, right, to, to uh, both professionally as well as in the, in the book market to bring, you know, a new product to market that's going to be beneficial to people. I think that's wonderful. So good job. May <laughs> I just that. say timing was, I, I can never plan this well. So. <laughs> well, it's and funny. you know, that's how it often ends up working out, right? Mm. Like we, we, we all do all these things. Um, and I found that to be the case in my career. Like I have, you know, we're, we, we're all spinning a bunch of plates on our fingers, right? And we're keeping all these different um, balls in the air. And, and some of them seem to stick and some of them don't. And as far as I can tell, there's often no particular rhyme or reason to it other than whatever just happens to be, you know, what fits with the particular time and space. Um, and, and sometimes things just fit better than others. And it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with like the quality of the work or the, <laughs> you know, the, you know yeah. the overall value. So that's also actually, um, you know, one of the points that I've tried to make when I'm working with colleagues internationally is like just because like we're working on something and it doesn't seem to be gaining a lot of momentum, right? That, that happens. Um, that happens in organizations when they're trying to innovate and bring new uh, products to market. It happens with academics working on, on research projects. It happens all over the place, right? And so I try to just remind them like, hey, just because, you know, this thing that we were working on last year or five years ago didn't seem to really resonate as much as we thought it would, that doesn't mean that it's not something we can't revisit and see how it how it takes now or doesn't take and some of the biggest successes i've had professionally actually have been things that have incubated over a really long period of time things that i even started years ago a decade or more ago and then revisited updated and realized that hey now it it, it, it didn't fit then um, now is the time and and it's and it's mm. taken off. So I think that's just a general good reminder to everyone as we're navigating, you know, the complexities of our careers. Um, but I don't want to I don't want to um, get too far off topic. So we we can come back to to your book. Um, so so tell us. Uh, you, you mentioned the research that went into it and a lot of interviews. So tell us about some of of those uh, those findings and what you found to be most compelling uh, and essential for leaders to understand or working, you know, in, in trying to lead these virtual international teams? So uh, I found a lot. And so I'll just narrow it down since we don't have days to, for me to talk. But uh, first off, culture does play a role. So, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Even my neighbor said to me, how can you sell books? Uh, we're all working from home. But in fact, even though I'm sitting in my own home, I'm still working with people from other working who are sitting in other cultures, countries, and they have a view on how to work together, how to collaborate, how to communicate, etc. So culture still shows up when we're working virtually. And from the research and from my own experience, I found that culture th shows up in three ways. What I call within the team, between the locations, and then from outside the team. And if you want, I can give some examples and we can. So yeah, in the first absolutely. one. Absolutely. Please. Examples are great. For, so, for instance, within the team. So that is the culture that we've been talking about for years, that we make decisions differently, that we uh, communicate differently, even something like a virtual meeting. So somebody from the U.S. would say, well, we're here to make a decision, communicate, make a decision, bring the right people to the meeting, and we're on our way. Someone from Japan would say, well, okay, we're having a virtual meeting, and it's for discussion, or it's for confirmation. And someone from Sweden will say something in the middle. Okay, we're having a virtual meeting and we'll have a conversation. And then we have to schedule another one so that we can, um, so that we can build consensus and make sure everybody has, made, has given their opinion. So we have Japan, Sweden, and the US all approaching something like a virtual meeting very differently. And if you don't understand that, it can lead to frustration and, and, uh, and other misunderstandings. So that's the first way within the team. And I'm sure you're familiar with this, with when you're working internationally, virtually as you are, I'm sure you've come across this in your experience. 
Well, and it, and it's yeah, absolutely, and it's it's really interesting to hear you articulate it that that way because I, I think that really resonated with me in, in the experiences that I have had, and it's also interesting, you know, of course, whenever we talk about kind of big bucket categorizations and cultures, obviously that's th these are generalizations we use yes. to to try to make sense of of, of general differences, understanding that you know it, individuals also have their perceptions and their um their preferences and and things absolutely. like that absolutely and and that's one of the things that stuck out to me as you were sharing that i'm like yeah i absolutely have noticed those types of of differences and how it can lead to frustrations or miscommunications um when i've worked internationally but i've seen the exact same things happen even within like a fairly close-knit team setting you know just with people say here in utah that i'm meeting with virtually, right? Um, the same thing can happen because the reality is people just have different kinds of expectations and preferences. And, and so one of the really important things is to just be communicative about that, right? And share your expectations and, and for the norms of these interactions and the meetings that we're holding so that people can be on the same page. And usually we don't communicate what our, our expectations are and norms are. Why? Because we assume the others are like us. And actually, what you've just mentioned regarding being in a co-located versus being in a virtual leads to my second way that culture impacts virtual teams. And it has to do with because we have distance. So, uh, and this I call between the locations. So the geographic distance turns into actually psychological distance in our heads. So people that are far away, we consider to be more abstract than people that are close by. So my colleagues that are close, like you mentioned, you know, Joe was funny this morning, Sue did a great presentation, and my colleagues over there, Spanish. So we often use abstract terms to describe things that are far away. And, and often if that can turn, and on a mild level, we're just sort of not collaborating well, but on a more dangerous level, it can turn into an us versus them, where we don't share information and we use cultural stereotypes to describe the other. And that happens in a virtual team. That wouldn't happen in a co-located team because that distance has an impact us, on us psychologically. And then the third way is what I call outside the team. So even though the team may form and have norms and ways of working and agreements, each person is in a different country. And those country cultures can influence the team in ways that are unexpected. And in my book, I give a couple examples and a couple stories. But in, if we don't understand that, if we don't understand beyond just our team, then as a leader and as a team, then we can put people in tense situations, uh, which we obviously don't want to. So it's culture impacts virtual teams and we really need to understand why. Yeah, and that understanding that why I think is, is important because it's not, I, I think we tend as human beings to jump to conclusions. So mm. when someone's doing something differently than the way we do it, we assume, like you said earlier, like everyone else is gonna do it like us. And so when they don't do it like us or they have a different preference, then we start to otherize them and we start to um, project like motives <laughs> onto people, right? And so then all of a sudden we start to label them as lazy or we start to label them as incompetent or even, you know, we can say, oh, these, you know, they don't have integrity, they're unethical, or whatever, like all these different labels. And it's possible that those things might be true, but it's, it's probably more probable that there's just some sort of cross-cultural miscommunications occurring, misunderstandings. And, and we really have to challenge ourselves um, to, to recognize those types of assumptions that we're making about people and, and the types of intentions that we're projecting onto people so that we don't make tense situations worse. And, and in my experience, that happens actually quite a bit. Mm. Well, this is why no matter, a red thread throughout my book is people need to develop cultural competence, the ability to work with others, the ability to understand cultures, but also more importantly even, to understand how they have been influenced by culture. And to be able to listen and create the space where people can share and understand each other and be curious. I mean, there's so many qualities of people who work well globally and with people from other cultures. And you're right, it doesn't come from reaction, it comes from reflection, learning, curiosity, listening, and, and all these beautiful skills that, uh, that we can go through the list.
Excellent. So, so all of these interviews, all of these research findings, what do you see as those most compelling, pressing issues and questions that leaders have on their minds right now in relation to these cross-cultural virtual teams and how to do it effectively? Well, I think we hit upon that a little bit in the beginning, which is what is the future going to be looking like? And it's interesting, I think, because it used to be that people were in the office. So my team, I would have three people in China, two people in Sweden, or five in England. Now I have them all sitting at home. Or now we're working from not home, but anywhere. So perhaps they're traveling to a place or a hotel where they feel comfortable because you know, they want to be in the sun and not in the cold of England. So I think there's this dynamic that's going to be happening of where are people and, and what does that mean for me as a leader regarding creating a team? Because it's no longer, when you're working virtually, this idea of the leader being the center, the hero, let's say, uh, just doesn't work because the, the micromanagement is, is very difficult in the virtual space. What does work is a team that puts the attention towards building those connections across the team so that they are working together and helping each other and supporting each other. It's, you start to get something called shared leadership. So I think that's really interesting to see how leaders have developed in the last eight months and how they're gonna continue that development going forward. One more topic that I notice uh, coming up in my clients, especially in Europe, is this idea of corporate culture. So we rushed, you know, in March in a couple of months, we rushed to learn to work virtually. Okay, everybody's at home, everybody's safe. And then we sort of had the summer and now this is going much longer than expected. How do I nourish that culture while people are at home? It used to be the building that helped us to feel belonging and connected. And I would, people would learn what the cultural norms are in the office, but now they're sitting at home and they don't have those cues and those signals. And so what does that mean for the organization as we nourish the culture, but also beyond as well? Yeah, I think that that organizational cultural piece is, is a really, really important one. And yeah, leaders are really grappling with that. I mean, it's, it's always yes. been a challenge. It's always been hard, especially when you have international teams, um, cross-cultural teams. Like what, what level of like uh, consistency in terms of those norms and expectations and how you communicate uh, company mission and vision and strategy, you know, how you do that with a cross national organization with international teams, it has always been hard. Um, but now trying to do it when people aren't even ever together, um, you know, it, that, that's a, that's at a whole new level. And, and so it is also raising the question, like how essential is it? Is it as essential as people kind of thought it was before? Um, is it okay? You know, that people, you know, feel committed to their jobs and to their teams, but that they don't, you know, is it okay for them to not have uh, such a firm uh, grasp on this kind of company-wide culture? Uh, can we foster more individualized approaches? Like, these are all the types of questions I've been thinking about, and I've, I've heard, you know, some leaders also express, and I don't have an answer to that. I don't, I don't know, you know, as we come out of the pandemic, I don't know if, if things are going to, you know, shift more back to the way they were the pendulum swung so far at this point you know certainly it's it, it's, it's going to go through a period of readjustment but how far back might it swing what are things going to look like and personally i you know i i'm a i'm a um, organizational um uh and I, i'm an organizational sociologist really by training academic training and so you know i, I think about the value of the cohesive team and group but I also think about the value of the individual uh, and, and being able to have authentic self-expression. And so like, and sometimes those two things are, you know, there's a tension that arises, you know, as people are trying to be their authentic self within this kind of dominant corporate culture. So I, I see potential there. I see a lot of potential for us to find a new kind of middle ground that gets the best, best of both worlds. I don't know. How, how do you see it as, as you've been researching for your book? Yeah, well, this is now beyond my book. This is really COVID topic that we're talking about. And I really appreciate what you've been saying. It's, uh, it's, I don't have the answers either, but I find it an interesting question. And it's one I'm spending time on. So I'm interviewing uh, leaders and reading and just like you as well, speaking with people. 
For instance, next week I have an interview with a, a leader of a 100% remote team. Now, for them, things didn't really change that much regarding how they work together because they've been working like this forever. So the question is, how do you maintain that culture? Or, or like you're saying, do we even need to? And uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. They do talk about values, but how much is it explicit or implicit? I think this is also an interesting, how much do we, when you're in the office, it's implicit, right? The building defines our culture, we see and, but do we need to be more explicit? But like you're saying, is it really necessary? How much do I have to have a mouse pad that says the company's name? Just as a daily reminder or not? I think this is an interesting question and uh, I'm, I'm curious to explore it as we go forward. Yeah, excellent. Well, Teresa, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. I know we could go on and on and on, and yes. we've really only scratched the surface, um, but that's why you have a book, right? So uh, <laughs> so I encourage uh, listeners you know, to check out Teresa, check out the book. Uh, before we close our time together today, I did want to give you a chance to share with listeners where they can find your book, how they can get connected with you, um, so they can reach out if they, if they you know, are looking at ways that they can improve their cross-cultural virtual teams. Well, first, let me say, Jonathan, I've really enjoyed this. So thank you very much. Uh, you read, listeners can find my book anywhere they buy books online. So it's at Amazon, but also at regional and country-based uh, bookstores as well. I really like to link with people on LinkedIn, so please reach out. I would be very happy to. Uh, also, I, if you do buy my book, I'm, I, I'm open for a conversation. I'm very curious your point of view, uh, given what I've written. So I'm, uh, please reach out and, uh, and let's see where we can go from here. Excellent. Thank you, Teresa. May I say one more thing? My oh, apologies. Oh, please, please. Yeah, I, I do have a website and a newsletter. So if you go to my website, interact-global.net, you can sign up for my newsletter. And in the newsletter, I share a couple articles from myself, but I also share articles from others, podcasts from others, because I want to keep, help people keep informed about what's happening. This is, we're figuring this out together. And uh, it's, I'm very curious what's, uh, what other people are finding as well. Excellent. So people can Thank sign up from the, my, the newsletter at my website. Excellent. I, I, I hope that listeners will reach out, get connected, check out the website, check out the book. Um, such a timely and important topic. Uh, we all want to do right by our people. We want them to, to feel supported. Um, we want them to feel safe. We want them to feel like they have the ability to do their best work. And doing that in a completely virtual setting is kind of this new thing that we're, we're trying to, to continue to figure out and wrestle with. Um, so I really, really appreciate all the insights that you shared with me and the listeners today. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And as always, I hope you stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.